for some reason, we really, I don't know, maybe we just believed the commercials, we, we bought into、mm-hmm. the propaganda. But we really, we genuinely believed that once we moved into this big, beautiful house with all this space and we got all the stuff, that that's when we would be happy. And so,、yeah. I mean,、mm-hmm. imagine our, our incredible surprise and shock when we realized it was having the opposite effect. It stopped making sense. No, no longer could we justify our lifestyle choice. My American dream, our American dream now looks like. Being able to say yes to the kids,、um, that's a, a big priority for us. You know, they're both they're 17 and 20 years old, so they, and they still ask us to do stuff regularly, and we really make the biggest effort we can to say yes to them. Our extra income that we make goes towards travel, it goes towards in, eating incredible local organic food. It、mm-hmm. goes towards donating to causes that we're very passionate about. It gives us extra time to be involved with our local community and to be advocates for different causes and to prioritize our, our relationships and our, our tiny house. It's very conducive for the type of, of life that we are passionate about, that we do enjoy living. This is episode five of the Own Stream podcast with Andrew and Gabriella Morrison. Welcome to the Own Stream podcast. So happy you're with us this week. This week we talked to Andrew and Gabriella Morrison, who are leaders in the tiny house movement. Yeah, we,、um, so this is Stephen, that was Teresa. And. Thanks for being with us. And yeah, the Morrisons have been of interest to us for many, well, probably about three years. First, I guess we ought to just talk a little bit about tiny houses and the tiny house movement. I don't know actually when it, when tiny houses began, but、um, certainly in the last five or so years, probably more five to ten years, it's become a thing. And. I think inevitably people who are looking for more freedom, more of their own time back in their lives, <clears throat> they look at their budget and you come to the conclusion that so much of time spent on a job, for example, is、uh, spent making the money necessary to pay a mortgage or rent. And we lived in New York City for a long time. We had a, a, a wonderful, beautiful home in Park Slope, Brooklyn, beautiful, terrific place. But yet, so much of our time was spent making money to pay for that house. Yeah, I remember. I mean, we loved, we loved where we lived, but I remember in New York, there was some kind of refrain like, you just need to expect that half your money goes to、yeah. your living expenses, <laughs> so whether, really it's, obscene <clears throat> whether it's rent or mortgage. And we just, like, anytime we thought about starting our own business or, or like, t- you know, doing something we were passionate about, leaving jobs. Um, to work on that, it was always like, da da da, but our mortgage, you know? <laughs> so I think we we saw, I don't, we, we can't remember, we saw, a, I think the movie Tiny, maybe. maybe we got so, interested、yeah. in tiny houses and then we started Googling around and Stephen found the Morrison's video. Oh my God. And, and if you're just being introduced to tiny houses now, let me salute you on your rabbit hole journey into YouTube <laughs> and all kinds of wonderful videos where people have shot of their tiny houses and the morrisons is probably the most viewed i can't say that with 100% certainty but as of today their nearly their their tiny house video has been seen nearly 10 million times so tiny houses are becoming a thing they're a thing they're already a thing they're not becoming a thing And really, so it's, it's about kind of pulling back so much of your resources、um, in the way we just described, but also about freedom of mobility. Many tiny houses are mobile. They're sort of like RVs that look like little homes, little houses. A couple years ago, we took a seminar here in San Diego, and a wonderful lady named B.A. Norgard showed up with her, what was it, about 110, 20 square 112, feet? 112 square、yeah. foot tiny house, which was really small. But she was absolutely thrilled to live in it.、Um, she does a lot in that house. She travels around. She inspires other people to live tiny. And、uh, many, many people are taking this very seriously and pulling back you know, this valuable resource of time. And instead of spending so much time working a job to pay for their house, they are moving into tiny houses, traveling, and living 
kind of uh, all over the U.S. and, and probably other places too. Um, but and anyway, so what's so what's so beautiful about the Morrison's video is that, and you'll hear them talk about this, is that they they just were following what they loved, you know, what made them happy, wanting to cultivate a richer sense of family in their lives and not be all spread out in a house that they um, were working jobs to pay for, basically. And and their video is just like, you know, very homespun, you know, they kind of were just showing you around their house <laughs> yeah. and following what was making them happy. And it attracted 10 million people because because people are searching for freedom. I think that's what we would yeah. say, you know, and looking to get off this mainstream path, which is so dominated by work and the need to make money for these things that. As the Morrisons show you, are not maybe necessary. A big house, a big apartment. Or don't bring you joy. Or don't bring you joy. And I think, you know, we, and, you know, if you see the video, if you look at the video, um, you know, we were attracted because I think you think of a tiny house, oh, like 200 square feet, like how could I possibly live in that? And we looked at it and it was like, oh, wow. It, it kept just like knocking down our myths about tiny houses, I think. Like, oh, it had a big kitchen with counter space and, you know, it had a full size fridge, full size fridge and a sleeping loft that had an actual staircase to it. And so we wouldn't have to be climbing up and down a ladder. And so a lot of the things that, you know, like might might get in your way in your head about thinking about living in a tiny house, if you actually start looking People have done amazing things with design, with tiny houses, and just really making it possible to live comfortably and happily and simply with everything you need. Yeah, it's pretty genius. And so we'll link to that video in the show notes. But Andrew and Gabriella Morrison um, have really become leaders in the tiny house movement, if you will, though there's a lot of independent people in the tiny house movement. But they've, you know, I think by virtue of that, that video, Um, They have a wonderful business where they travel and they teach other people how to to build their own tiny houses. And and within the tiny house community, there's a real DIY spirit. People want to kind of do it themselves, hearkening back to this fabulous ethos of of Thoreau's, of kind of having a moment where you build your own home. People are doing that, and it's... um, it kind of, it, and it irrevocably changes people from what we've seen. And the Morrisons have a beautiful story where they, you know, they had this moment where they realized that the way they were living wasn't what they really wanted, and they did something very dramatic. I won't tell you what that is. They describe it so beautifully. They ended up in a beautiful location for a period of time, reevaluating, kind of starting over, starting back from zero, and then launching from that into something more consciously designed, more meaningful to them. So um, Andrew and Gabriella get into a lot of this. They're so eloquent and wonderful. Their relationship really comes through beautifully in this conversation too. Um, I think a lot of people who go tiny end up realizing that their relationships become more richer because they're not hiding away in these large houses from each other. They're really brought into a more intimate space with each other, which is really uh, I think shines through in, in the two of them so nicely. So um, anyway, <clears throat> oh, at the very end, you'll notice that uh, <laughs> if you've been following our podcast, we have been asking people five questions at the end. Well, we've trimmed that down to three. That may also change a little bit. We're this is still a work in progress. So if you're caught by that in any way, we do change. We only ask them three questions at the end. And be sure to listen to that because they're really, really interesting. Yeah. So we will be back afterwards to wrap up. Until then, enjoy this terrific interview with Andrew and Gabriella Morrison. But a few years ago, um, I think it was me. I think I was on YouTube or something and um, your video popped up. And it was around that time that... um, we had been interested in tiny houses for some time, uh, but this had, it was featured as like a top search request or something. And so I watched it and I think I showed it to Teresa that night because it was so well done. It was such a, it was such a beautiful video. And I think it, it was um, <clears throat> clearly Andrew, your ability to talk about it was very clear and it, you, you made it seem like, gosh, this is very conceivable and I think if I remember correctly you had the the exact cost of the build at the outset of the film and I think it was down to like the scent (laughs) (laughs) it was funny thing about that video is honestly we just created it as um more of a a promo for people that might be interested in our plans completely unbeknownst to us would we end up with nine and a half million viewers however many we have now it's incredible (laughs) Yeah, 
we, I mean, we literally thought maybe 12 people would be interested in it. It's really long. I mean, this is way longer than the average attention span for anybody doing anything on the internet, 28 minutes or something like that. Poor Andrew's hair is completely disheveled. Yeah, if, if I had known <laughs> this many people, I was in I was in the stage of growing my hair out, quote unquote, by a forty some year old, which didn't work, so it just looked really ratty. <laughs> <and terrible. laughs> so maybe it was perfect the way that it was, though, because we we showed up just as we are. And um, but yeah, that was kind of the the surprise hit of the season <laughs> was was that YouTube video. And was it was it done at Christmas time? Do I remember like a um. A wreath. A wreath? Was there a wreath there? Something there like was, that. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It must. Have been, it was. It was fairly, well, like it was dry outside, right? So it wouldn't. Yeah, but it was chilly. Yeah. It was definitely chilly. I don't think there was any grass. Maybe it had been November or something. Like that we get we get snow up here, and and then we get sort of socked in with snow around Christmas time. We still have about, oh, I don't know. Six inches, maybe. Yeah, we're looking outside our window right now. We're we're in our loft, and we have an amazing view. We're kind of perched up here on these five acres, mm. really in this densely forested um, area, and we have so much snow on the ground. And this so is in down. Oregon, is that right? Thank you. <laughs> and you guys are in Oregon, is that right? Yeah, yeah, we're in southern Oregon, and we we we're up pretty high. We're almost four thousand feet uh, elevation here. Nice. So even nice. in town, it'll be like nothing. Or you look up and, oh, look, they got a dusting on the hills. And, and we'll have, you know, 18 inches, two feet of snow. So it's like, that's not a dusting. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, we, um, you know, I think one of the things that made that video so compelling was how real you guys seemed and how natural it seemed. And also, you know, I think for us at the time, I, I think I'd seen a lot of very small, tiny houses that maybe one person lived in, but that was the first one we'd seen a couple live in that seemed to be a design that had all the spaces in home that we would really want. Um, but we'll get a little more into that in a bit. I think we wanted to start out by talking about, I, I know that you you guys were living much larger um, sometime before you got into the tiny house. And I know there was a trip to Baja involved and a big change. Can you tell us a little bit about what life was like before and what what compelled you, what moved you to make that change to tiny? Yeah, we um, found ourselves in um, this situation where we were able to finally attain the American dream. So all, all of the things that we had valued and come to esteem about what it means to be successful in this culture and um, to be able to create the best possible um, circumstances in life for our children to thrive in. And here we were finally living in our dream house on the dream street, um, in the dream neighborhood, in the dream school district, and, um, you know, something interesting happened. I would say within the six months of moving in, um, kind of this um, incredible giddiness quickly transformed into a sense of real heaviness and burden. And um, as a family unit, we started to notice that all of us were no longer really thriving. And it happened in a very short period of time. It's not that we were living um, – in, in an incredibly uh, different situation before, but all the houses that we had been had been quite a bit smaller, a bit more on the modest side, and um, the bedrooms had been smaller, so we had spent a lot of time together in, in, in living room and dining room and those kinds of things. And then in this big house, we all moved in and sort of scattered into our individual corners. We got busy. Um, we had to work a lot more to, to pay um, for the expense of, of living in much larger square footage. And yeah, after about six to eight months, we just kind of started to notice it enough that we began to really assess and, and question what was happening, what had happened to kind of our, our close knit, happy, uh, family. And right around that time, I got, um, an email from, um, somebody who's still a friend, Ken Griswold from the tiny house blog. And he had been writing to me about something unrelated to tiny houses, but in his signature file was the tiny house blog.com. And I'd never heard of a tiny house before. So I went online and, um, and, and I jumped down the rabbit hole and, and things transformed for us pretty quickly from that point on. 
I think once we discovered what a tiny house was and what the tiny house lifestyle uh, represented, it helped to framework and give us an understanding of why we were struggling mm. and why um, the dynamic had changed so much for us having moved into this bigger house. And um, yeah, once once we realized that, things changed very quickly for us. It's amazing how fast uh, we noticed things like, hey, look, we have this extra room in our house. Why do we have an extra room in our house that we don't really use for anything? Um, and, and then, you know, shortly after that, we started measuring up our square footages and saying, okay, well, there's that room that we don't ever go in. Our bedroom has, you know, all this extra space that we don't need. Mm. And we added mm. all that up, and all of a sudden we're looking at, okay, so what does it cost us each month? You know, we're working so mm. hard to pay for this thing. And it was like, so some of that money that we're actually working to to pay for our housing could – really be saved just by the fact that we don't even use these these spaces. Like, why are we paying for that? Right. Yeah, once you start right. to break down uh, the the cost of living by square foot and how, how much of that square footage is actually being used, that can be um, a very shocking number. It certainly was for us. I would say in the previous house, we were spent paying for about – 70 percent of house that we didn't use yeah. efficiently and effectively on a day it, it wasn't bringing us significant benefit to our lives wow. it's all wow. the money was just pouring pouring out and then the pro the problem quote I'm, I'm, you can't see i'm doing quote unquote but the, the <laughs> problem <laughs> with with suddenly <laughs> discovering that um for us was we had this experience of having what we what we'd still talk about where you can't pull the veil back down like once the veil's been lifted on how crazy it was. I mean, literally, it was crazy. We're we're working so hard and barely, you know. Well, I won't say we were barely scraping by, but we were we were we were certainly working hard to pay for that house. And then when we realized what what a what a struggle it was for really no reason, it's hard to go back to being willing to pay for that house. You know. So it was very soon after that that we're like, we're done. Let, let's let's get out of this rat race and. And we we sold or gave away eighty percent or ninety percent of what we owned. Um, got rid of the house. Got rid of the house. Got rid of the excess extra car, and, and I think we sold both cars, didn't we? And then we no, we, we well we ended up with just one car yeah. instead of two. Uh, yeah, within uh, within six months of of that, we were out. We uh, bought a used pop up tent trailer. We drove down to the beaches of Baja, Mexico. Our daughter at the time was 10 and a, a budding marine biologist, and she had been raised on Jacques Cousteau documentaries, mm. and so she'd been hearing about the Sea of Cortez for a good portion of her life. Mm. And it's just generally not a bad place to drive to if you're going to go live on a beach somewhere. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, yeah so we, we got to have an incredible experience down there. Really our intention and goal in going down was to um, redefine what home meant to us. We were really clear <laughs> that, that we had a lot of uh, programming that we were carrying around for, for our whole lives in terms of what does define a house, what, mm -hmm. what do we need in order to survive, what is really important and necessary. So we figured, well, probably the best way to get clear on what the vitals are is to go go do something, really separate ourselves from from the day-to-day -day, uh, habit and go down with the absolute bare minimum and then build up from there and see what it is mm -hmm. that we miss. But surprisingly, we went down. I mean, you know, it's like a fork and knife, a spoon each, one cup, one bowl, one plate each, one frying pan, one little saucepan, uh, two pairs of shorts, three T-shirts, one long sleeve, one jacket, three pairs of socks. We should have brought more jackets. It actually got cold at night. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. I mean, we the guy down. on the beach who was selling blankets. There was a couple of times where we're like, "Hey, buddy, we might need one of those." Blankets. <laughs> and uh, we just found that we, you know, we really went down thinking, "Okay, this will be be good because we'll realize what's important and, and what we need in our lives." And we're like, "We don't need anything." Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the happiest yeah. we've been really with just yeah. with with pretty much not. I mean, again, it certainly helps where we were living, but even that, there were challenges with, with that. You know. We didn't sleep very well at all because we were at the bottom of a hill where the trucks would drive all night long and they would jake break down the hill, which was like, <laughs> I swear, every, at least three times a night, I'd feel like we were, any second now, the truck was going to come straight through our tent and kill us because it was sounded so close. <laughs> so like, it, it wasn't perfect, um, but we we really recognized all those things that, that really matter for us. It was, 
just the simplicity of it was so perfect. And that, so there was, was there, when you were living in that big house, was, was there one moment or was there one fact, uh, one, anything that you can point to looking back that was, let's call it a turning point. And, um, and then I guess underneath that, I'm interested in what kind of values did you discover you had naturally that that kind of quote unquote America dream conflicted with that then caused you to make a pretty dramatic move, sell all those things and go to the Baja Peninsula? Yeah, I think the the thing that comes up for me on that, um, and it kind of happened halfway through your question, was when you talked about what like what's at the core for us. And, and for us, it's really about family. Um, and, and there was something we didn't, we weren't clear exactly what it was, but there was something happening within the constructs of being in this bigger house that was changing our dynamic. Uh, and, and so it was really, it was, a, I would say a, a series of investigations trying to figure out what was going on, why was this happening? And then it, it just dawned on us one day, I, I think it was, we said something to the kids where we said, no, we can't, we can't go do that. We don't have time. Mm. And yeah. And and they kind of disappointingly walked out, you know. And every parent, just so you know, every parent does this. You're gonna have it. It's, it's gonna happen to you too. And we've been doing it <laughs> lots of times, but I think you know, all of a sudden, you you maybe it's like yeah. We recognize like wow, the impact of that, and and it was something that was like, hey, can we? I mean, I'm totally paraphrasing or even making it up, but basically like, hey, can we go do something as a family together and spend some time together, just having fun? And our answer was like, no, we don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Good work, David. Uh, the house, yeah. and, which is a horrible thing to experience in, in in seeing it, but also was that that catalyst for us to make the change. So we thought that the way to to be the best parent, because family has always been the top priority. That that hadn't changed. That that's always been the case. But for some reason, we really I don't know. Maybe we just believed the commercials. We we mm. bought into mm. the propaganda. But we really, we genuinely believe that once we moved into this big, beautiful house with all the space and and we got all the stuff, that that's when we would be happy. And so, yeah. and I mean, mm. imagine our, our incredible surprise and shock when we realized it was having the opposite effect. It mm. just, it wasn't, mm. it stopped making sense. No, no longer could we justify our lifestyle choice. Anymore. The other day, we when we came back, we were just in Baja over Christmas break again this Christmas, and we came back, and it had been very, very cold um, here. And there were a couple of things that that we learned the hard way by going away. But we came back, and all of don't us, fill your water tank before you leave town in the middle of the winter. <laughs> All of our systems are down. Our fridge uh, had stopped uh, working. Our heater was broken, and our water lines were frozen. So we ended up uh, actually. Our lines were okay because I remember to drain the lines, but the 1,500 gallon water tank was a solid cube of ice. Oh wow! That was oh, where wow. the real problem was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, thought I was yeah, being yeah. smart by filling up the tank before we left. And so we ended up staying at a friend's place uh, down the road from us. That's like a normal sized house and and you know with the kids obviously and um and we were down there for a couple of nights while we kind of got everything thought out up here and um and it was so interesting because one of the evenings Andrew and I we were talking as we were getting ready to go to bed and just kind of experiencing our family dynamic in this bigger house and wondering to ourselves like have have we somehow you know, has there been any error or flaw in, in us doing the tiny house thing? Yeah, do we shortchange the kids do, in any way? Yeah, are we like mm -hmm. depriving them in some way because we live in this tiny house. It's you know, it's very different. It's it's not without its challenges and and then finally we got everything thought out. And we had the ability to stay in this big house for free with all of us for for an entire month. And once the kids heard that everything was ready to go, and it wasn't place, even ready to go. It was like mostly ready to go. We're like, we're pretty sure the heater's working, but we're not entirely sure yet. And both of the kids are like, okay, well, we're going back home then. <laughs> they wanted to go back up to the tiny house. Yeah, it was that was home. That was really neat for for us to see. You know, it, it, it was neat to mm. see that the, that is their preference, and they and they do love it. They really enjoy being up here in this lifestyle and, um, and luckily the heat was working and the heater was working <laughs> yeah you you said that um part of the process was 
redefining what home means to you and reprogramming. And you said, you know, you had kind of bought into the commercials, so to speak. You know, I think a lot of us, you know, the American dream, all of that really, people can identify yeah. with that, you know. Can you talk a little bit about that reprogramming process and also what kind of what you thought you might get out of the American dream that you now are actually getting out of redefining a home with your family? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in terms of re repatterning, um, there was a significant repatterning that happened for um, us when we went down to Baja. And when we went down and we, it was a very, you know, conscious, deliberate move. Our daughter was very involved with the decision-making process. Our son at the time, who's a nice hockey player, had gone off to Colorado to play because he'd outgrown hockey in our valley, and that was what he wanted to do. And so, um, you know, off, off we went thinking we were going to this amazing paradise. And we got there, and after a few days, we um, started to experience an incredible amount of discomfort, and we realized we were going through significant withdrawal. So there was a, a repatterning happening. We were mm -hmm. withdrawing from the busyness of every day, um, the day-to-day -day bustle, from electronics, from social media. Um, yeah, go from running a, an internet-based company um, and Tara, our daughter, being you know young, but still all the kids, you know, they're all into their Facebook and Snapchat and Lord knows what else, and, <laughs> right. and and none of it. All of a sudden, all of that was gone, and we were left sitting in a pop tent trailer with electricity when the sun had <laughs> batteries and nothing else, and going, what are we doing? <laughs> um, so we this may not have been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> what year so was that, by the way? This was 2010. But that one month took about four years to get through. That's the that's the key yeah. there. So um, yeah, we the the repatterning, the kind of the the shift in our paradigm happened in a very short span of time. Even though the 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 month felt like it was incredibly long, but that the thing that was so neat about that experience is that we really got to go through. Um, an incredible shift and transformation and, and do so together with, with our, our daughter. And so by the time we got out of that, I think we just kind of broke loose from, um, I, yeah, just the, the, the patterning and we're able to see, um, what our priorities are in a, a really clear and, and beautiful way. And that, that, that knowing and that awareness has stuck with us through all of these years. So that's been, you know, six years now, almost seven years. And then in terms of the, our life now, you know, I'd say we've, yeah, we redefined our, my American dream, our American dream now looks like being able to say yes to the kids. Um, that's a, a big priority for us. You know, they're both, they're 17 and 20 years old. So when they, and they still <laughs> ask us to do stuff regularly. And we really, you know, make the biggest effort we can to say yes to them. Our, um, the extra income that we make goes towards um, travel. It goes towards in eating incredible um local organic food mm. um it mm. goes towards donating to causes that we're very passionate about it gives us extra time to be um involved with our local community and to be advocates for for different causes and um and to prioritize our our relationships and our, our tiny house really is an, a wonderful vehicle for allowing us to stay closely connected and, and the kids so we have these five acres and we have our tiny house, which is 207 square feet plus 110 square feet in lofts. And then each of the kids has their own sleeping cabin, which is right next to um, mm. our place. And so that's great because that gives them a place. It'd be, I don't think we could do the tiny house thing with kids that age <laughs> <laughs> for one roof. But they, they come and in then here. And you get like, you know, you have, how cool is it that our 20-year-old son's got a tree house and our 17-year-old our daughter's got this cool little cabin of her own like yeah, it's pretty awesome you know, it, it's pretty it's what, i was gonna say it's pretty chill <laughs> it's really what the kids are pretty excited about it yeah and so they they come into our space here and and hang out and we can't help but bump into each other and um you know 
talk and hang out. And um, so that's, yeah, it's, it's very conducive for the type of, of life that, that we are passionate about, that we do enjoy living. And so when you left Baja, you're, you're, you're there for five months and was the next move to like, okay, we want to buy some land or did you move into something temporarily? Talk about how that process went to where you are now, five acres of land, 315 ish square foot, tiny house, two homes for the kids. Like was there, was, was it, was the land purchase first or how did this develop? We ended up uh, coming back, and <clears throat> we couldn't find a place small enough to rent. Um, and it was actually a pretty big challenge. All, all the houses <laughs> just too big. So we ultimately found a place, um, and, and, and the market was really strong too, so it was hard to get a rental place in and of itself. Uh, but we finally found a place. We, we rented it. Um, we turned the master bedroom into our office and turned the master closet into our bedroom because that all nice. felt like a better oh, nice. scale. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we lived there for a little bit, not, not that long. We were there maybe almost a year or six months, something a like year, that. Yeah. And then we actually moved out to Colorado, um, and lived out there for a year with our son. Um, his second year in school, he asked if we would go out and he, uh, both our kids have celiac disease. Um, and as a, a 14 year old kid, he really struggled with the concept of not being able to eat gluten. Um, so he asked if we would go out and help him and support him out there, which we did. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and that was uh, another big house. <laughs> it was like a, a, a tri-level house that seemed crazy. Um, and then while we were there, that's when we, we realized, you know, that we were ready to, to fully create the life that we wanted. Um, and that although we were, you know, still obviously we're traveling in support of our son for the, that, that year and we're, you know, still our priorities of family were still there, but we just, we just felt the, the call was too strong. We needed to, to actually do something about it. Um, and when we were in Colorado, we went online we knew what our budget was, and it was pretty low considering our our area. This this part of Oregon is pretty expensive, um, and we looked at, we looked online at something that would work for us financially. And there were three or four basically like tenth of an acre industrial lots, which just looked absolutely horrible. <laughs> or or there was five and a half acres up on the the hillside with the view of a view of a, a, a ski slope mountain and just looked absolutely gorgeous and oh by the way it has a tiny house on it already um and we're like wow. what what <laughs> how does that happen wow uh, and it was just a little shed it was the guy who had been coming up here with his wife and they would they would drive up here in the summer just for a weekend so it was literally a 104 square foot little cabin with a like a little sink that was on a spring um and uh, an outhouse and a, and a futon it was perfect so we came out here and looked at it and Although it was under three feet of snow when we, when we looked at it, we're like, yeah, great. It could have all been paved for all we knew. I mean, it was just, it was totally covered in snow, but it, it was perfect. Um, and then that was, however many years ago, that was almost five years ago now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, almost five years. So, and we've been here ever since. Wow. And so obviously family is, is central to you guys and always has been. Can you, can you talk a bit about how you're, I know you said your kids now, we're really eager to jump right back in and get home. Um, what that was like originally for them, and have have there been you know any other family members, any other kind of um, reactions you got from people as you were as you were making this major transition? Um, I'll start first with, with with your first question there about the kids. Um, I think from the beginning uh, they were pretty excited about it. Um, the, one of the first things we built out here was uh, our daughter's cabin. Um, and she, and she was, she made a deal with her brother about whose cabin would get built first. And she <laughs> felt pretty cool. She had won. So she had the first structure out here. Um, so she, she was excited about that. And then when we built the house and it started to get all kinds of coverage, um, I remember the story of our son who was in Colorado at the time, like we said at school, um, his, his, uh, roommate was on his computer and was like, dude, you gotta come. This is the coolest house. You gotta come see this. And, and he, he, <laughs> Over and the kid's like doing a whole tour of the house. He's like, yeah, that's that's my house. <laughs> what? Uh, like, there was always that sort of cool factor. Um, and I think in terms of have we had any sort of different different views of it? Absolutely. I think that the in the beginning, in the beginning, people are like, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning, people were really worried because you know, like when we started talking about this in like 2009, 2010, people like the 
I mean, the tiny house movement was there, but it was it was not as well known it as quiet. it is now. There weren't TV shows and all these books and stuff. There was a couple books. And so people were con- like genuinely concerned, you know, like really wondering what the heck we were doing and where so we... So wait, only 200 square feet? <laughs> 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 right. And the thing that's interesting too, it's like, you know how when you're just clear on something, you're clear. And I remember before we went to Baja, like those those questions and, and people sort of doubting our decisions really used to weigh heavy on my mind. And then we had our experience in Baja. And when we came back, it was like people would express their concerns and the concerns would just roll off of me because I knew I knew what was true for us. Like I knew what we what we wanted and what we needed to do. And so they're just I don't know. I don't know if people stopped expressing concern or if I just stopped hearing it because mm-hmm. it just there was nowhere for it to stick anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Dealing with resistance, I think, is something a lot of people have to get through. Um but it doesn't hurt now to have a video with 10 million views approximately. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, yeah, now, now that some of the family members that, <laughs> that were concerned and, and had not so quiet judgments about now they're very proud of us and are very <laughs> right. media stories about us yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> Although I will say there, are, there are a few holdouts um, who, who think it, uh, it's, it's a fad, maybe one, maybe one or two holdouts, not, not many. Uh, but oh, you guys won't. You guys won't last. They're just waiting for like when we said that we were going to be down at this house down the road because everything was frozen. They were just you know oh, waiting. Oh, full size so house. So you are <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're just counting down the yeah. days. But it's been like, look, three if, years. If you're in your full size house and you have no drinking water, no heat, and no refrigeration, that's cool. I'm sure you would stay too. No, I don't think so. <laughs> right, right, right. We needed to get out for a week or a couple of days. <laughs> well, I can imagine. So um, I, I don't want I, I, I have a few lifestyle kind of other lifestyle type questions. But um, before we kind of make that transition, I'd love to kind of just get into the design of the home itself, because when we looked at it first, as Teresa said, it was like, oh, wait, this has lots of light. There's different areas in here for different kind of parts of life. It looks incredible. It's beautiful. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about the design, kind of going through the process of, of putting it together, designing it, and then building it, moving in. Because it's become, I think, within the tiny house world, like a real, it, it was a moment when that house came out. And uh, I, I think we'd be remiss not to cover that because it's, it's, it's so, it's such an excellent, excellent home. Wow, thank you. Thank Rich. you. <laughs> just let me just stop blushing, and I'll, uh, <laughs> um, no, that's 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 very kind of you. Appreciate that. Um, I, I, so the design, which which design process, which of the fifteen renditions where we would like have it perfectly, and then be like, ah, oh, crap, I forgot to put the fridge. So, we don't have a fridge. so yeah, it took it took some work. Um, we really started with, well, actually, we originally started with looking at other tiny houses and saying, okay, how can we adjust this? And and for us, it just wasn't possible because what became the focal point was that we needed a full-size kitchen, and that didn't exist. There were really there were two major things that didn't exist that, that we were not willing to go without. One was a full-size kitchen, and the other was stairs. We, we did not mm. want to be climbing up the mm. ladder. And I say in, in the workshops that we teach, I say, Look, anyone in the room over 40 realizes exactly why you don't want to climb up and down That's the ladder. Right. I because- was going to talk to you about that, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I know why those stairs are there. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so, yeah, but those things were – those were crucial. Um, so, yeah, we quickly realized there was no way we could do it in, in the spaces that were had been done before. So we just you know, basically created a, a, a blank slate and started with, with knowing what it is that we want. Um, and going for it. And what's funny is that, you know, as much as we wanted, you know, we filmed the process so we could teach people how to build. I mean, that's, that's what we've been doing for years is teaching people how to build. So it seemed appropriate. Um, but we really had no idea the impact that this house would have that, that, that really was sort of out of nowhere. Um, we did, we designed it for us and and we built it for us. And obviously it resonated with more than just us because people have been pretty interested in it. And you have a, you have a background in building, isn't that right? 
Yeah, I've been a builder for about a little over 20 years. Right, right, right. Sorry, Gabrielle, I cut you off. I was, yeah, I was just going to add that the way that our design process happened was when we were down in uh, Baja and we knew we were going to want to create something, you know, tiny house lifestyle where we didn't have a specific vision. So we we created a list of non-negotiables of items that we knew we would need to have in whatever home we designed and built for it to be a long-term solution for us. A lot of the tiny houses we saw were, were beautiful and fun and whimsical but we couldn't picture ourselves living there for 10, 15, 20, however many years. And so this, I mean, this list was like, felt gluttonous, you know, like full kitchen with full size appliances, home office for two, guest bedroom, a lounge We're space. We're never going to fit all of that in there. <laughs> and we just kept, I mean, so many renditions. We're going to need a tractor design. trailer to pull this thing. <laughs> <laughs> We got it all to fit in. I mean, really, we there were things we were not willing to compromise on, and 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 we we got them all in. There isn't anything that didn't make its way in there. So it's yeah. When we talk to people about designing their place, we actually suggest that in the initial stages that they actually dream really big. That mm-hmm. they really on their mm-hmm. list, they put down everything that they really value deeply in in a residence uh, whatever it is that's going to make it feel like a home um for them and then and then you know be be daring and, and bold in the design process i think people are you know are often surprised by how much can be put into incorporated into a space with really good design yeah i think when i yeah. saw the video i i remember seeing the full-size fridge and thinking that that was like I had never seen that before in a in a tiny house. We had watched video after video of them, and and it's and just for people who are listening may not have seen the video, we'll link to it in the um, in the post uh, dedicated to this podcast episode. But it's not like the fridge is like jammed in. It's it feels great. There's plenty of space. There's there's lots of air in the place, and it, nothing feels forced or squeezed into the home at all. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, when we first watched the video, that was one of, I mean, all the things you just listed, I think Stephen and I kept thinking, well, I don't know if we could do a tiny house because we really like to cook and we need counter space and we need a fridge. And, you know, Stephen, the stairs was a big thing, you know, we can't do the ladder loft. And I think we just, I think that was it. We were, we were looking at your house and thinking that, and what a, what a beautiful concept that compared to how you felt in your bigger house about you know, all this wasted space, basically, you know, you're, you're customizing every space for something that you really value and need and, and that you could do that with all your non-negotiables in that space is, is, was really compelling to us. Awesome. That's cool to hear. Well, I wonder now, um, you guys were so thoughtful about your housing and, and, you know, creating a home for yourself. I wonder how that has maybe impacted other areas of your life. And in particular, um, well, certainly your relationship to things and, and material goods is now, I'm sure, obviously shaped by the house itself. But I imagine that there's a lot of choice that goes into that, a lot of thought that goes into, like, how do we buy things and how do that works? So I'd love to hear about that. And then also your relationship to food as well. Like what kinds of food do you eat? Do you have a certain diet? And I know you mentioned earlier about kind of locally, organically grown foods. I'm interested in how those areas of your life have perhaps changed in light of this decision to go tiny. Yeah, we, we, um, I would, I would, I don't know if we were ever huge consumers, but we were, we were definitely consumer uh, driven. I um, mean, I think anyone who lives in the U.S. if they're not awake to the fact that they're marketed to every second of the day, <laughs> right. tends, to, tends to end up buying into that system. And we had done that to some extent as well. Um, and and now it's it's definitely much more conscious. We we really look at you know one of the experiences I have if I go out and I want something that I see on the shelf, uh, I'll say, oh that's that that looks amazing, and then I'll of not buy it, uh, and if I, if I if I think about if I think about it, you know, three more times, ten more times, it depends on like the the scale of it. You know, if it's a candy bar, I might have to think about it three more times in the next eight seconds, and then I might go back and buy it. Right, right, right. You know, things that are going to actually take up space and and be a commitment. I really think about those purchases. Um, a story I like to tell: I was I went to uh, I went to a store to buy a new pair of pants because I, I needed a, another pair of pants, and 
in uh, found finally found a pair that I liked, and as I was checking out, the woman said, "Well, they're they're buy one get one free, so you can go grab another <laughs> pair." And I was like, "Oh, that's okay. I don't need another pair." And she said, "But they're free." And I'm like, yeah, they're "Free, but I don't need a second pair of pants. Like I needed this pair of pants." Um, so and, you know, she really didn't understand what was happening as <laughs> so I was checking out. Um, so that I thought that was you know that kind of just. A, for me, was was really representative of how how it how shopping has has changed for me. Where it's really if I need it, there's a difference between what we need and what we want, and and sometimes what we want is not something we actually have to have, and sometimes it's okay to buy it, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it just becomes an impulse thing that actually ends up taking away. So it's like that short term gain takes away from what we want in our long term uh, long term goals and our our long term vision of our life. So it's it's really about paying attention to what really matters, um, and then for food, Gabriel, you, should, you want to talk about food? Yeah, food is, you know, really a huge part of our our lifestyle, and I think especially since the kids do have celiac um, disease, we're very, uh, I don't know, just aware of the, the things that we put into our body because I think we see the effects that certain foods can can have on it so we really value um good healthy clean um just the you know the best quality food that we can can find and yeah, we feel very lucky that we can that we have the resources now to to be able to put focus on that because our food budget is huge it is you know we don't have a housing payment we don't have utility payments actually we just got rid of our our last last remaining payment we got rid of today we had a volkswagen and we did the buyback program so we don't have a car payment anymore but we definitely have spent a lot of money on food but it's one of these things that it's we're so happy to spend it because it's uh you know i think in some ways we feel that food is medicine and um so Mm. we we're investing into our health by Find yeah. the best quality food we can get. Can you talk a little can, bit more about that? We're definitely in the food as medicine camp, you know, and um, having experienced all kinds of uh, I don't know, health and uh, weight and other challenges with the standard diet. Uh, you know, we've we've been very conscious in our diet too, in terms of um, whole foods and for us plant based. You know, is is that? Can you talk a little bit more about your experience with that specifically? Yeah, I think we have a couple of different approaches. Uh, in in general, uh, we we tend to eat, or especially Gabriella eats more paleo. Uh, my belief is that the more Twinkies I eat, the more my body will be preserved. Uh, <laughs> so I think that's the. Oh yeah, yeah it's all about Twinkies. <laughs> right, right. It's an embal- I think there is embalming liquid in there, by the way. Yeah, I think I think that's probably. <laughs> so I think you're onto something. <laughs> they just called it cream, and it marketed really well to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we're um i i'm kind of i'm kind of right now not so much paleo and i'm doing a little bit more grains than what i have been in in recent past and um just sort of trying it out and i'm noticing a change i'm, I'm definitely not uh as felt as i could be um but you know I'm, I'm still in a healthy range but uh i can i can feel it a little bit more so than when we're eating paleo but i think other than that i mean we're uh, kids are gluten free uh gabrielle's gluten free if she does ever do grains um other than that, I think we're mostly just paleo. Got it. Yeah. And um, with all the the, <clears throat> I know that you mentioned on your, I think in your bios on your blog or something, but travel something really important to you. Do you guys get to travel a lot? And when you do, do you ever travel with the tiny house itself, or does it stay there? The tiny house definitely stays here. And they have overhead bin restrictions and stuff, so you can't. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and- and um, you, we could move it. However, I don't think it would make it down our driveway and right. not so much right. because of the driveway, but where our very steep driveway meets uh, the level uh, road down below. That, or a road that that's pitched going the other direction. It's that like... grade change is, is pretty dramatic. Um, no, we do. We travel a lot. I would say, you know, the, the way that we – enjoy life the most and like to celebrate being on this planet is by getting out there and seeing the world around us. It really is our our favorite thing. So we, we're, we travel, um, quite, quite a lot. And the kids have been to, um, a lot of places and internationally. And, um, that's been, yeah, one of the, 
the, the great, great things about this new lifestyle is, is having the, the resources to be able to do that. That's, and languages that's, languages are also something that's very important to us. So Andrew's taking a Spanish uh, language program with a tutor, and I'm doing Swedish. And uh, so, yeah, we, we just we like to go out and, and see the world. And I think that is one of the things that's great about the tiny house lifestyle is that it is easy to just kind of close up the house, drain the water lines, and take off for empty the tank empty the, the, empty the, the tank right don't forget right don't forget <laughs> i think that's that's one of the things we're so interested in in terms of the freedom that uh the tiny house tiny home lifestyle affords and i think you know you you mentioned when you were talking about living in the bigger house um you know the jobs that you had and and sort of like having to say no to getting to do things with your family because you were too busy um you know one of the things i think people in thinking about that american dream people end up you know with a mortgage with a big house they have to pay for and get stuck you know one of the other things is in a job they often get stuck um can you talk a little bit about that transition and i i think now you i know you've been a builder for some years and we talked about that andrew um you now you run your own online business essentially teaching people how to go tiny and you sell plans for tiny homes. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? We've actually been doing similar things to that for a long time. Um, <clears throat> I stopped building hands on what, 2007. Mm-hmm. So yeah. 10 years ago. Um, so I, I was a contractor for 10, about 10 years and then um, moved on to teaching and, and I've been teaching people how to build straw bale houses uh, for a long time since 2007. Um, and so we had, a, you know, we had a DVD series, uh, instructional videos, that whole thing. So very similar to what we've done with the tiny house. Um, so, so really for me, uh, and this may be off what you're heading for with your question, but for me, th- that type of business is more in line with, uh, with how I see myself, quote unquote, best used in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. My biggest goal uh, in everything I do is to inspire other people to reach their goals. Like that, that to me is where I'm most excited. So building a house is great, and it's you know it's fun, and there, there's there's value in that. Obviously, and creating shelter and beautiful shelter for people is a lot of fun. But inspiring them to do that is even more fun uh, because it 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 spills out as you guys have already hit, hinted on on a number of different occasions. It spills out into all aspects of life. So it's not just the house. It's you know how do they um, when, when people come to our workshops, like at the end, uh, one of the questions that we want to know is how, how has their life changed in terms of their relationship with the concept of building tiny or in terms of the relationship of the things that are holding them back from turning tiny or in terms of communication and connection with other people around them and, and, and learning to use uh, all the tools that they have around them to really create something beautiful. So that's, my, that's where I'm most excited and most, most fired up is, is in, in inspiring and and sharing what I know in a way that uh, creates something powerful in the world. Mm-hmm. Is that is, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gabrielle, I'm not did sure you want to add to that, or is that? Um, I mean, the tiny house build website is that something the both of you work on together? Is it like a family business essentially? That is yeah. a family business. It is, and um, yeah, I think one of my big observations in life. So I'm 46 now, so I have a fair amount of experience and many more years, hopefully, of experience to gain. And um, having kind of run the gamut of, of um, lifestyle uh, uh, choices, careers, um, just kind of, you know, choices that I've made in my life. One of the things that really impresses me is and I see this again and again, not just with us, but with other people, that when people are doing something that they're really passionate about and they have a huge yes for, mm. that kind of starts to create its own weather pa- pattern that can sustain itself and launch somebody into these extraordinary new experiences um, that perhaps they wouldn't get if they were just kind of going through the, the normal day-to-day routine and so by us saying, like, for example, Andrew hanging up his tool belt in 2007, that was a really big risk for us. It was, I wasn't working because we really valued me being, you know, stay at home mom and we were homeschooling the kids mm-hmm. and, um, we didn't have savings and, um, 
we but we also knew that Andrew was just really getting run down and feeling pretty beat up by being a contractor. It's a really it's a very intense profession. And um, we knew we had to create a change. So he we had started he specialized in straw bale construction and we just ran one little sort of test workshop to see what that was going to be like on our property built a little structure and like 15 people signed up almost right away so like okay well maybe we can do another one so a couple months later we ran another one and well sure and i mean literally within i would say two years at the most we were running six to seven workshops a year Andrew stopped working for other people and, and because his passion really is um, he's being with other people, um, giving them the resources, empowering them. And he's, he's really, he's, he's very, very good at it. And um, She's reading my cue cards right now. She's doing great. <laughs> <laughs> the world just sort of opened, opened up and, um, you know, and I, again, it, it was, it was a risk, you know, you, you, and at, at some point, I think everybody has an opportunity to, maybe not everybody, I don't, I don't want to generalize, I can't speak for everybody's circumstances, but I know that we had an opportunity to make a decision to try something different, and I'm really glad that we did take that risk, um, not knowing what the outcome was, was going to be, and just kind of followed the, the guideposts, and it's all been just incredibly, it's been amazing ever since I heard Jack Canfield speak once and he said you know if you're driving from california to new york you don't have to be able to see the entire way that you're driving you can be driving in the dark the whole way and you just follow the headlights you don't have to know what the outcome is going to be from the beginning or what it's going to look like you can go in total pitch blackness and you just you know follow the lights that are just right in front of you and it's it really has been an extraordinary journey i mean again that whole thing with the youtube video with the our tiny house we built it for us you know we thought yeah you know there might be some interest but we didn't know that we would you know the opportunities that have opened up the thousands of people that we've met the tens of thousand people tens of thousands of people that we've interfaced mm -hmm. via social media and our website and um the you know the, the incredible people um we mm -hmm. just could never have have seen that and that that all really started from that moment in 2000 and i actually think it was more like 2006 where we said you know what we're we're not going to keep doing it this way anymore and let's let's go for let's let's take the risk yeah it's exciting um and i, I i'm curious if you looking back at that moment um one thing that i think is common is people will create an image of what they think it's going to look like we're going to take a risk and and we're going to do this and then this is what it's going to look like now that you're if it was 2006 say 10 11 years later looking back does it look anything like what you thought it would look like oh my goodness no <laughs> no no way. I was going to say exactly as I had seen it. <laughs> <Fire>. <laughs> no, I mean, it's literally so beyond even the wildest, wildest, wildest dreams that yeah. we could possibly have mustered up at that point. It's it. There is no way we could have anticipated yeah. everything that would have opened up um, because of that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, so we had this straw bale thing going on in the beginning, and, and it was, at first, it was, wouldn't it be great if we could have some supplemental passive income? Like, wouldn't that be neat? Mm -hmm. uh, and then it became, as Gabriel said, we got to be doing more and more of them, and I stopped working and started doing those, and, and that became really fabulous. And, and then, you know, that already was exciting that we had gone there. And then when we got into the tiny house world, it was like a whole other door opening up, and uh, it was funny. I, I went. I went to a workshop early on, and uh, I had I had gone sort of just quietly, you know, just to to see what I could learn. And uh, by the end of the class, I had people around me who had recognized me from the straw bale work, and others who hadn't, who were saying, "Well, what do you think about that?" Because they could obviously tell I had building experience. Um, and and it it suddenly became clear, like there's there's value in being able to teach people. And and it's I, I kind of jump all the way back to. Um, my sixth grade teacher and my second grade teacher and my fourth grade teacher who all said in my, you know, little 
when you, you have little reviews with your parents, what, what are they called? The parent, parent teacher meetings. Um, <laughs> and, and they would say, he's a people person. He's going to work with people someday. Mm-hmm. And it was mm-hmm. sort of like, I was doing that with contracting, but not really. And so landing in this was like, wow, that suddenly it's, it's the fulfillment of that vision of those teachers. And so they had more of an end game vision than, <laughs> than I did. I had no idea where it was going to go. Uh, and it, it was amazing the connections. I guess what I'm trying to say is the connections across those two different industries, the straw bale and tiny house, were surprising. Um, and the fact that we've been able to continue to do both of those things now is also surprising. It's not an either or, it's a both and, which is a nice uh, something that I hadn't expected for sure. Mm. We're, we very much believe in uh, following your excitement, you know, following your bliss. You guys talked about your yes, your passion. Um, we talk a lot about following the breadcrumb trail and I like the, the analogy of the headlights. Um, you know, what, what do you think, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people have something in them they want to follow, but they're really not ever able to make that jump. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what belief or set of beliefs you think enabled you to veer off the mainstream path and really follow this, follow your joy, follow your values, take the leap and, and do all of this that you've been able to do? Well, there's, from our perspective, there's three things that have to line up. Um, and you have to have, so this, this passion or spark that you're talking about that, uh, that's gotta be there and you have to be good at it. Uh, and then it has to intersect with a need in the market for it. So, you know, I've said this before at some of our, our workshops, you could be the best, best, best person at, at creating, uh, you know, edible shoelaces, but if nobody really wants to eat shoelaces, it's not going to matter that you're really good at it, right? Like you're, you're, you're super passionate about it and you're really good at it, but who cares? Our daughter will so, buy those, by the way. <laughs> Our nine-month-old was just eating shoelaces before this call. You'd be surprised what's successful. I tell you what. But I'm going to stop using that example now. That's it. I don't have to market for it. But you know what I mean? Like you have to have all three of those things. And, and I think that was – uh, that's often the case with people who like they have a passion about something and it doesn't intersect with the market or there's a market need for something and they're passionate about it, but they're just not very good at it. Um, uh, you know, I, I know people in my own life who are very passionate about certain things and, and they go out there and they, and they speak about them and it, the way that they speak about them really turns people off. Like they're just, they don't have, they're, they're not people, people, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. So, you know, it just depends on what your strengths are and how you can recognize where your strengths and your weaknesses are. I think that's a big piece. There's a, do you guys know who Chris Gillibo is? Sure. Yeah. 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 He's, um, he's fantastic. Um, and so in so many ways, and, um, one of the pieces I really appreciate about him is his ability to, um, uh, sort of uh, discover incredibly creative ways that people are generating an in- income, just things that, that are so sort of off the wall that you'd never think of. But it's, it's amazing. I think that for, for a lot of us, we, we do have so much um, opportunity out there. And um, we, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people are limited in large part by their by their internal programming, by whatever stories and tape that they're telling themselves, and I think for those kinds of situations, it's so helpful to just um, start to be to be curious and start to do that introspective, um, self reflective work. You know, start going to um, sort of empowerment workshops, reading really great books uh, with people that have overcome all sorts of adversity and. And, and get excited and empowered about life and then start to find the ways like Andrew's teacher is saying he's, he's a people person. I think that we all have these inherent gifts um, that, that are just a part of who we are. And so it's about kind of removing the, the barriers, whatever sort of mud we've, you know, slung onto ourselves over the years just through, you know, whatever childhood and, and growing up experiences that we have and kind of start to do uncover the our, our, our beautiful shiny parts and 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 then getting excited about stuff and taking again i think a lot of it is being willing to take take risks i think our our um willingness to be 
with discomfort and our willingness to be with fear is a really big part of our ability and potential to um, live the greatest lives that we possibly can live. I think a lot of people become paralyzed and crumbled by fear. I know that I certainly do, so I have to do a lot, a lot, a lot of work um, to to overcome that. And um, But, the, you know, the great thing with all of these things, it's, there's, there's so much help out there. There's so many incredible resources and tools. I, I honestly believe that all it takes is somebody being curious and being willing to try to do something different. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. um, and then having some level of tolerance for discomfort, because whenever there's change, there's, it's going to be discomfort. And I try to look at discomfort as actually a really useful guidepost because it indicates that something is changing. I'm trying something different. And then there's opportunity for something great to come out of that. And is there a kind of like a spiritual approach or a spiritual view or views that help you with this fear, with this discomfort, or if not spiritual, some kind of belief or practice maybe that uh, gives you yeah, a view sure. beyond those things? My, my mantra is to not believe my thoughts. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's that, you know, the thinking is the, 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 the limitation and, um, I think that certainly my experience when I, once I started to question my thoughts and really um, be willing to sit with them and um, and hear them out and but also be willing to challenge them. Um, there's a process by Byron Katie called the work, um, which mm. is a, a, an incredible turnaround um, process. Yeah, turnaround. Turn, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's a, part of the process is that there's there's actually a turnaround, and you get to experience part of part of the process. You get to experience what you, who you would be without that thought, whatever the thought is at the moment that's creating stress. Because you're in in the work, you're looking at your stressful thoughts, and um, and you know, and and the great thing, the invitation is like you don't have to get rid of that thought for the rest of your life, you know. But just like in that moment, you know, can you? Are you willing to let go of it just enough to see who you would be? And um, it's pretty amazing. I, I, it turns out I can be a very different person um, mm. with a lot more more joy and um, security and um, um, just sort of, uh, I don't know, ability to, to be comfortable in the world when I when I don't believe my stressful thoughts. And I just, I just choose not to pay attention to my thoughts. I find that's just the easiest thing. <laughs> just ignore. I just ignore everything. <laughs> no, for, for me, um, the work is definitely a, a powerful piece. Um, and, and I find that one of the things that's come for me time and time again is, is really the simplicity of just, you know, seeing what, what it is that I want or don't want, like really getting clear on what those things are and then investigating what's in the way of that happening. So if I, if I want something or if I don't want something, like why, why am I getting the opposite of what I want? Um, and just sit with that and then recognize, okay, so there, there's action steps I can take and really coming back to the, to the, the place of wanting to prioritize joy in my life. So is it something that's going to, that's going to move towards me prioritizing my happiness or is it going to move towards something that's going to cause me frustration at the expense of getting something else. Well, then what's the point of it? Uh, so there, there's there's quite a bit of that that goes on. And then the, the last one that I've just recently added um, through my, my learning Spanish um, was the other day I was in I was at class. I, I work with a woman in Mexico City um, via Skype. And, uh, you know, I finished the class and I, I said to Gabriela, man, that felt like it was just like hitting my head against the wall. It was, it was a hard class for me and I, I just – was a little frustrated and she said yeah but if you look at where you started you're so much better than you were you know to the point where i should record myself and listen to myself six months from now and see how how it's changed mm -hmm. and what that really got for me is I, I need to acknowledge every little amazing thing that i do um and it's it's paying attention to those little things where i put my focus that actually helps keep me in line with with feeling empowered and feeling uh like i'm i'm living the life that i want to live and, and staying focused yeah, yeah, it's 
it's so important it's to have so a practice for us too. We, we were also curious about, you know, again, from the image we started with to, to where you are now with your, with your home and the land, if being close to nature has, has changed, how, how being close to nature has changed and influenced your life and your practice. Um, well, yeah, I don't, I think the nature piece has just <clears throat> been a constant for us for the majority of our lives. That was actually one of the ways that Andrew and I, um, really connected initially. We met in college. Hmm. Um, we met in college 23 years ago, 20, oh geez, I'm losing track. <laughs> a lot of years ago. <laughs> Back when we were young. And our, <laughs> back when we were young, <laughs> we were just little whippersnappers, was um, camping. And um, I think we've always just somehow known, been affected by the healing power of, of being out in nature, feet rooted to the ground, um, disconnected from from day to day bustle and um so yeah i think we're lucky that way I, I don't really know who to attribute that to because neither of my parents were my dad was you know like new york city photographer and my mom was very you know cosmopolitan although she definitely has a sort of an earth quality to her too but yeah, and Angie's parents also very British and My parents were very outdoorsy though. Were they? Yeah, they were they're true, definitely yeah, British, but we would um we would we would camp and, and go fishing and, and things like that. And we had the my parents bought a, a vacation house from when I was like tw ten or twelve maybe, uh at this lake in Pennsylvania, which seemed like the middle of nowhere to me growing up outside of Manhattan. It seemed like Right, you know, right. like absolutely the the middle of nowhere. So I think they definitely instilled some of that in us, in in, in me and my sisters. I would think, um, but there's also just an innate power to it. You know, it, for us when we go out and we're sitting out in nature, it's it's just there's something there that that's calming and peaceful and dramatic and wonderful and inspiring. Yeah, I think the reason why that question is so appealing to us is because we lived in New York City. I lived in New York City for 21 years. And um, yeah. we moved to Southern California just a year ago, and I'm looking outside right now, and it's certainly not pastoral. I mean, we by any sense, but just seeing trees <laughs> and dirt is like yeah. oh, that's so amazing. Look at that brown stuff. You know? And it's also <laughs> revealed to us that we want more. You know, yeah. like we're we're closer, like that following your joy, right? You know, we're closer to what we want, but we want more, and and we're following that. Well, yeah. we should wrap up. We've we've um, taken a little bit of your time. Thank you. And um, I think to conclude with, we have three sort of questions we try to ask all of our guests as a way to um, create some consistency because everybody's very different um, within the series. Um, and then before we end, I'd like to I'd like for the both of you to quickly just talk about the work you've done recently related to the the legislation and the coding in particular around trying to make it more feasible for, for people to build tiny homes. Um, Cause I know that's something that you've been uh, involved with directly. Um, but real quick, um, <clears throat> what book or books and let's maybe a list of three, do you think every person should read? And <clears throat> the way we often think about it is, is like, let's say you have a child who's coming of age in this world, in this society, what three books should that young person absolutely read well this is going to be an unconventional cool. <laughs> response cool but cool. uh i can't recommend more highly enough the happiness project by mm -hmm. gretchen Rubin. Right. and it's actually right. it's uh it's a five-year journal so it'll be the book about whoever is writing it and it's super neat it's a one-sentence journal um every um page is the same date but for five years, if you can visualize that, there's there's five paragraphs, essentially. So for January 1st, you would start with 2017, then on the next, the same page, the next year, 2018, 2019, 20, and then you just write a short snippet of what you did 
that day and going through this exercise. So now I'm on, on, on year two and getting to reflect on what I was doing last year. Even the really mundane things that I think are so uninteresting, it actually turns out that they are really very interesting in reflection. Hmm. Um, it's, a, hmm. it's a neat uh, perspective. Let's see. In terms of another two books, Andrew, do you have um, the, recommendations? The, the first book that came to mind for me was The Prophet. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not that it's necessarily specific to tiny house living in any way, but it's just a book that's been with with me my whole life, um, on and off, and and it's a, a great little book to look to for inspiration from time to time. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I mean, I'm like a, like the Tao of Pooh. Like there's there's <laughs> there's a, there's a <laughs> kind of books that I've been into over the years. And uh, the Giving Tree, the Giving the Tree, giving tree spans yeah, come on. all. Yeah, all that's true. Yeah, gosh, I remember when I read that. Did you read that? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, that's yeah great. definitely. That's great. Uh, so, especially as tiny housers, this one's interesting to us. Um, what thing, item, or keepsake have you owned for the longest period of time? Something you've held on to and why? I have um, a silver rattle that was given to me the day I was born it's from Tiffany. Um, and, uh, and Tiffany's Tiffany's and very um, fancy, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it's got all these marks and stuff. I guess I used it as a teething tool or so. I'm actually oh, wow. not really sure how I managed to do that, but there's something about this, especially having gone through the extreme downsizing process that to me is a, a non-negotiable item that I will never get rid of because it, it literally has been with with me uh for for since since the day that i was born and i think that's i think that's really neat yeah i don't i don't have a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to think like I, I i think the answer to your question is um a large teddy bear and a small teddy bear their names believe it or not are big ted and little ted uh, <laughs> And and those were my my teddy bears when I was a kid, um, but I don't have them here. I actually have them in a box, and and the the idea with them is that I want to eventually give one to each of my kids for their kids. Right. Uh, right. So it, it's sort of that that's I've kept those things, but I don't you know I don't have it here with me. He's um, not very sentimental. So, I'm I'm quite sentimental. Well, I'm very sentimental, but I'm also like. Not the, pra the pragmatic, <laughs> like a pragmatic yes. sentimentalist. And Andrew, are you willing to divulge your Twinkies hiding place? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the third question is, and I think that's pretty sentimental to teddy bears. Um, the third question is, uh, what have you learned in the last 30 days that you think everyone should know? Don't fill your water tank before you go to Mexico. <laughs> um, I have learned something actually I, that feels very profound um, to me, and that is to speak, to stay quiet um, in the interest of quote unquote keeping peace when something is. Um, uh, clearly in my perception is is so um is going so wrong um serves nobody and that's that's a, a big big piece for me because i am um i'm an introvert i'm pretty shy um i am a peacemaker and i'm having to really find find my voice and express myself and stand up for things that i'm very passionate about and it, that feels very risky and scary. So this is this is my lesson of the month, and um, we, we'll see how it all goes. But um, yeah, that's speak speak your mind when you need to. And I think for me, the the thing I've learned and again and again, I guess because I thought I already figured this out, but maybe not, um, is that at some point there comes a time where you just have to go. So if you that didn't sound right at all, but. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll see you later, Andrew. You're getting down the stairs. That was supposed to be inspiring. I don't know if that... <laughs> um, what, what I mean by that is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's possible to get stuck in planning forever. Um, and if you're, if you're making a change in your lifestyle, if you're making a change in your work, 
you're making a change in your relationships, if you're if you're if there's something that you're so drawn to, but you just can't get past that last step of fear or whatever it is, it may not even be identified. There comes a time where it's just time to step forward and just go for it and and commit and go. Uh, and that's a that's a very powerful tool because once the commitment is made, at least in my experience, everything starts to fall into place because I've shown I've I've shown that I'm ready to take on that next step and 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 stuff lines up. So that that's been my lesson. Wow, that's really strong. <clears throat> I um sometimes I, you just have to go, right? So. Yeah, sometimes you just got to go. That's why you got the stairs, right? Um <laughs> Well, I both of both of your responses to that are are a rabbit hole for me and I know for Teresa too, so we should probably just stay away from mm-hmm. commenting. She and I will probably talk about that You're all night. You're just nodding, nodding, yeah, nodding. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> um so before we sign off, um, <clears throat> I want to give you both a chance to talk about um, certainly any upcoming events or appearances you'd like people to be aware of that you're involved in. And for sure, um, talk about the legislation that you've been instrumental in uh, in moving forward. I'm not, I'm not sure where it is in the process, but I know there's a process that's unfolding and maybe catch people up on, on that as well. Sure. Well, I'll start with that. Um... So, and that's a rabbit hole in and of itself. Like there's a long, there's a long answer to that question. And then there's the one I'm going to give you. (laughs) But there's some info on your website, isn't there, where they can go. Maybe we can steer people over to that. If there, there's actually, um, uh, there's, there's a link that Gabriella created that put basically anything related to this code topic. Any of our blog entries are all accessible from that page. Um, so we can give you that link and you can put that up on your on your page as well and then people can click right. over to that. Um, so yeah, so so the basic scenario is um, I have since the beginning been very adamant that tiny houses need to be considered houses, not RVs. Uh, and the industry has been moving more towards being a tiny house RV. Uh, the problem with that is then you, you can't live in it because you're not allowed to live in an RV on the same piece of land in most jurisdictions uh, for more than 30 days or maybe 180 days. Uh, but it's not permanent housing. Uh, so uh, through a friend of mine from the straw bale world who was actually at uh, the code hearings in Kentucky, mm-hmm. I think it was, yeah, yeah. in Kentucky, um, so there was someone who had proposed a tiny house change, a code change, and it was absolutely horrible. It, it basically just said, we're not going to meet any of these five things, deal with it. I mean, literally, that's basically what it said. Um, so he, he said no to that. He stood in, in what he called friendly opposition. Uh, but in, in doing that, he contacted me and said, Hey, this is happening. And, and there's an opportunity for us to, uh, what's that going to keep thinking? There, <laughs> there was, uh, yep. <laughs> sorry about that. It sounds like, a, uh, um, like a Zen Buddhist sort of bell or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's yeah. all about perspective. As these, right. as these incredibly informative pieces of information hit you, those bells will just That's chime. Right. That's right. That's <laughs> the sound of it sinking in. That's the sound of it sinking in. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So move forward. Uh, so uh, my friend Martin Hammer um, came up. He, he discovered that there was a way to write a public comment, it was called. So we could basically write the code and submit it as a public comment to that existing code that had been denied. We would have to win the first battle, which is getting it accepted, which we did. Then we would go to uh, Kansas City and have a first battle there of having the original vote overturned so that they could hear our proposal, which we won. Then uh, they, hold our, they heard our proposal um, and they voted on that, and that was a two-thirds majority of. There were hundreds of, of building officials and fire marshals, and it was very, very intimidating. Um, but we won that vote, and then it went out to the entire International Code Council voting community, which is upwards of ten thousand people. No, it's twenty plus oh, thousand. Twenty people. plus thousand yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Um, who could vote? And we had to win a two-thirds majority of that vote, which we won in December. So it has become uh, Appendix V, as in Victor. Uh, called Tiny Houses, and it's an appendix in the 2018 International Residential Code. So that's the exciting part. It, it covers basically everything except for the fact that they're on trailers. They would not allow us to do that in this in this version. Hmm. Uh, but if you meet everything else, uh, you know, ceiling heights, sleeping lofts, it's sinking in, uh, <laughs> emergency <laughs> egress, all that kind of stuff. If you if you match up all of those things with the the code that we wrote, uh, the only thing left is the trailer, and you could go through. Section R104.11, which allows you to basically submit things that aren't in the code as long as they meet the intent of the code. So there are still ways to move forward with that. Um, Now the big challenge is we have to 
um, we have to have all of the areas that use this code adopt the appendix because it doesn't come in automatically as an appendix. Um, the main body of the code is automatic when it's when it's adopted by a county, but each of the individual appendices can be uh, approved, denied, or left alone. So that's going to be the big thing, and we're still waiting on the final final official release, which should come in the next week or so from the International Code Council. Once that's happened, we're going to be putting out a big push for right. Um, right. for grassroots help to get that word out and get it approved. So local tiny so, house communities. Um, that's when they can mobilize. That's when they can get behind that and try to kind of steer that through their local council members. Is that how that would exactly. go? Yeah, exactly. And we'll we'll create a uh, you know like a like a, a script or a talking point or a sample letter. It's the same thing we did when when we were uh, trying to canvas for votes for the of those twenty thousand uh, plus building officials, having individuals and, and groups in their local communities talk to their officials and say we want this, you know, and really give that feedback. So we'll we'll continue to do that same same thing. Well, tiny houses is becoming a real thing, for lack of a better word. We went to an event this weekend, and um, it was here in Encinitas in Southern California, where there are very few tiny houses, at least within the town itself, and certainly within San Diego. Once you get further east of the water, you start to see more of it. But there were like three or four hundred people that RSVP'd for this thing to the point where like they had to, you know, cordon off parking. They had to get permits like it, it became far bigger than they expected. And I think it's because people are becoming more and more interested and in understanding, I think, largely due to people such as yourselves and, and a few others who are out talking about this, publicizing it in such a positive way um, that makes it very feasible and very digestible for people to to see themselves doing that yeah so um, you're 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 really doing a great service and um, and we're certainly grateful for your time and, and is there anything else you'd like to say maybe any any kind of tiny house build programs coming up or anything within the business that would be helpful for folks to know about yeah, we'll be um, in Atlanta February 11th and 12th. We'll be in Dallas in May uh, teaching tiny house workshops, I should clarify. <laughs> yeah, we're just going there if you, you, know, if you happen to see it. <laughs> Got to get to Atlanta in February. It's hot. It's really cool. <laughs> the, the Atlanta class is actually, is actually That's full. That's full, yeah. Um, uh -huh. but uh, yeah, we teach two-day tiny house um, workshops, and we cover mm -hmm. everything from code zoning, roofs, framing, pooping, oh. Sex, if it comes up, <laughs> that's one of the frequently asked questions. We don't offer it, but people can't resist. But right. ask us that for so many reason. Um, and yeah, in Dallas, we'll be in Toronto, we'll be in Köln, Germany. In July, we'll be in Seattle. Um, and then, and then that's that's what's on the docket so far, and we'll, there'll be more coming out later. And then in October, so uh, we're, we're taking our own risks and we're just driving with headlights and we don't know. <laughs> and sometimes you just got to go. Sometimes right. you just got to go. We are <laughs> launching um, a workshop series that, that we've been dreaming about for many years now, and it's called Create Your Freedom. And the inaugural, inaugural one will be in October here in Ashland, Oregon, in our hometown right down the road from, from us. So we, yeah, we're, we're going to be walking our own talk. And, and that's a bigger scope that's, you know, it's lifestyle, housing, uh, emotional, you know, doing some deeper work to get some of those blocks out of the way and financial, financial stuff, stuff yeah. health and body. So it's, it's a three-day, uh, all-inclusive, um, hopefully, uh, yeah. <laughs> hopefully all-inclusive workshop. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're and we're super, super excited about it. And we've done little teasers of it in the past with great success and great feedback, but we've never committed to the the full three-day. And so this was that literally that was that lesson for me of sometimes you just gotta just go forward and just make it happen. That is great. Awesome. You know, as awesome. you guys have been talking, I keep thinking like these two really should be life coaches they should i mean <laughs> they, there's so much dimension to what you've been through and and you're both very eloquent in very different ways about it and i would imagine people could learn more than than although tiny houses and, and construction and everything that i'm sure you teach is is so helpful but 
there's more to it than that, and it sounds to me like you guys would be great at teaching that. I, I'm sure that'll be very successful. We'll let you know at the end of October. Yeah, nice. <laughs> nice. Thank um, you. Well, listen, thank you both so much. This has been just terrific. Uh, we're very grateful so, to you for your time. Oh, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. We look forward to following that workshop and everything else you have coming up. Well, thanks so much. It was great uh, talking with you guys. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I had a great time. Really nice to get to connect. All right. Well, that's it for this week's Own Stream podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. We do hope you enjoyed this pretty wonderful conversation with Gabriella and Andrew Morrison. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode for links to everything mentioned, including more on their workshops, their website, Tiny House Build, their social media handles, plus, of course, a link to the YouTube video of their tiny house, which, as we said, is At the time of this recording, nearly 10 million times has been viewed. Maybe you will be the 10 millionth. All of that can be found at ownstream.co backslash morrisons. That's ownstream.co backslash morrisons, M-O-R-R-I-S-O-N-S. Also, before we let you go, please sign up for our weekly tip-off email at ownstream.co and just click the sign up button in the upper right-hand corner. This is where we share each Monday three cool things we've learned in the last week in the areas of lifestyle, business, and spirit. This could be an amazing quote, individual, tip, or tool designed to bring you more freedom and power in your life. So definitely sign up for that, again, at ownstream.co and just click sign up. Finally, follow us on Twitter at ownstream and on Instagram where we do post regularly at own underscore stream. Thanks so much, and we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening to the OwnStream podcast. To learn more and connect with us, please visit ownstream.co or follow us on Twitter at OwnStream and Instagram at own underscore stream.